Would you like to know exactly what happens between now and the time that Jesus comes? Adventists, whether they are Baptist Adventists or Methodist Adventists or Presbyterian Adventists or Catholic Adventists, are interested in that. An Adventist is anyone who believes that Jesus is coming again. Now, of course, you say we know all about that because we have studied the prophecies and we have the charts and we have the eschatological layout. But I'd like to suggest that often we become more consumed with the things having to do with international and political issues. We're interested in the things in the Far East and the Middle East and the Near East and the United Nations and the oil country and the King of the North and Turkey and all of those. When it seems like it would be more practical to become consumed with the things internal and experiential. What exactly is going to happen in your heart, in your experience, between now and the time that Jesus comes? What's going to happen in the hearts of the collective group that represents God's church? What's going to happen in the world? outside the realms of church. I feel that God would have us talk about this, not only today, but in a sort of series in the next few available Sabbaths on this subject. I'd like to introduce this by turning to Revelation, the third chapter. To begin with, Revelation 3, a well-known passage, but invite you to take a second look with perhaps a little different twist. Revelation 3, beginning with verse 14. And uh, unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. It is a message to Laodicea. You've heard about this ever since 1850, if you've been around that long. And the students of Revelation have taken it that this was representing the group of people, representing God's church, that exists shortly before Jesus comes, up until that time. I'd like to suggest to you that if a church is called Laodicea in God's prophetic eye, that more than half of the people would have to be what the church is called. In order for America to be known as a democracy, we assume that the majority of the people in America believe in the democratic form of government. And the day that that ends, that day we will stop being a democracy, really. So in order for Laodicea to be Laodicea, more than half of the people in Laodicea would have to be Laodiceans. Would that be safe to say? Which means that if there were two million people in the church that is called Laodicea, probably a million plus would be Laodiceans. This means that in that church or organization, if it was an organic situation, that the majority would have put in to leadership 
those of their own, and there would be a good chance that uh, there would be Laodicean congregations here and there, there would be Laodicean church leaders, there would be Laodicean administrators, there would be Laodicean teachers and faculty in schools, there would be Laodicean Sabbath school teachers, there would be Laodicean preachers in the pulpit. Is this going too far? Let's not fight it. Let's uh, at least roll with the ship enough to admit this possibility. And the beautiful thing is that God himself foresaw it. He was not taken off guards. He is not surprised. He wrote it down centuries ago. Now, what is it that characterizes a Laodicean? Beginning with verse 15 of this chapter and going through verse 17, I'd like to suggest part A, or the first part of the Laodicean message. Starts out with, I know thy works. So Laodicea does not come short in works. That's what it's known by. It doesn't seem likely that the the, uh, great emphasis needed to lay it as seams then would be for more works, does it? But in spite of the works, thou art neither cold nor hot, it says. I would thou wert cold or hot. God prefers cold or hot to lukewarm. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Laodicea gets spewed out. Does that mean the church called Laodicea gets spewed out, or only the Laodiceans that are in the church called Laodicea get spewed out? Then what would it be called? I would like to suggest that it would then become the genuine remnant spoken of in Revelation. Right here, let's take a look at what it is that causes lukewarm. I hesitate to give a lesson in elementary home economics, but um, in our kitchen we have a spigot that uh, is able to produce water, and if we want hot water, we turn in the channel from the left side. If we want cold, we turn in the channel from the right. If we want lukewarm, we try to get equal parts of both. Uh, Does that sound something like your kitchen? So lukewarm is a combination of uh, something like half hot and half cold. Does this mean then that Laodicea is one million hot and one million cold, perhaps? Or does it mean that a Laodicean would be hot on the left side and cold on the right side? Or uh, exactly what does it mean? You find a clue to this in Matthew 23, which you might want to read this afternoon before your uh, other activities. And that's the famous chapter where Jesus struck out at external goodness. If you will analyze that chapter carefully, you'll discover that The problem of external goodness is when there is goodness on the outside with badness on the inside. Or, apparently being hot on the outside, but cold on the inside. So if you take a typical Laodicean or lukewarm person, may I suggest that it is a person who looks good on the outside who has all of the works 
externally, but who is cold on the inside. You put the combination together and you get lukewarm. This is the problem of Laodicea. And verse 17 continues with the rebuke. Thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. You'll have to admit that verses 15 to 17 are rather hard-hitting. It is what we might call or label the rebuke to Laodicea. But the love of God is so fantastic that he never leaves a person reproved and rebuked and wounded and bleeding without giving him comfort and peace and counsel. And this brings us to part B of the Laodicean message, which comprises one verse only. Verse 18. I counsel thee, and we're going to label this the counsel. The first part, the rebuke. The second part, the counsel. A very significant point. Follow it closely. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. If you studied this Previously, you know that gold represents what two great elements? Faith and love. Faith that works by love. The two great elements that are the most conspicuously absent in the church, according to inspired counsel. Seek the gold of faith and love, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed. What is the white raiment? Thank you. I know the rest of you are out there. I can hear you breathing. But uh, the white raiment is the righteousness of Christ. That the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. This is the hardest one usually, and we'll go further into these in the Sabbaths to come. But this eye salve, if you discover represents the Holy Spirit and his power to help us discern, have insight, to see, and uh, primarily to see our condition. One of the most conspicuous things about Laodicea is that it does not know its condition. And that is an untouchable situation. God does not work in a vacuum God is not involved in performing painless surgery on our brains. God doesn't make us righteous by doing prefrontal lobotomies on our cerebrums. God is in the business of helping us to see our problem so that we can take it to him and trust him for his power to deal with the problem. And uh, he wants later to see it to see and acknowledge its condition. May we go so far as to say right to begin with that Laodicea is more than likely our condition. We are talking about us. The last church up until shortly before Jesus comes. But notice something even more interesting. When Jesus comes, there are only going to be two groups of people, not three, only two. They are called in the Bible by different labels. 
the good and the bad, the righteous and the wicked, the sheep and the goats, the wheat and the tares, the wise and the foolish, and here the hot and the cold. When Jesus comes, and he is the true witness, you know, he says he's going to bring his reward to reward every person according to their works. And God is the only one that can judge according to works. Remember that. Because only God knows the motive from which the works came. Man cannot judge according to works. Not even himself. He is going to have rewards for only the righteous and the wicked. There is going to be no lukewarm lake of fire for the lukewarm. That would be preposterous. So the big penetrating question is, if there are three groups of people up until shortly before Jesus comes, hot, cold, and lukewarm, what happens to the lukewarm? Well, of course, the scripture says they get spewed out. But how? Exactly what is it that takes place? In connection with this, you find a very interesting chapter in the book Early Writings. If you haven't read this chapter, you ought to give it a try. It's only three or four pages, page 269 to 272, and it is entitled The Shaking. It is borrowing from an old method of thrashing wheat, the shaking. If you go to some parts of our world today where they're still primitive, you can see them thrashing wheat the same fashion. They take the wheat out of the field, put it in a pan, and they shake the pan. As they shake it, the wheat and the chaff separate, still in the pan, but separated into two entities. Then they toss the whole thing in the air, out of the pan. Hopefully there will be a breeze blowing. The breeze sifts the chaff away from the wheat because it's light, and the wheat, because it is heavier, falls back into the pan. The first part of the operation is called the shaking. The second part of the operation is different. It is the sifting. They are not the same. You might have read something lately that indicated they were the same. The shaking and the sifting are not the same. So um, what is this shaking and sifting? Jesus told Peter in Matthew, or rather in Luke 22, he said, uh, Peter, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. Borrowing again from the analogy. But he said, I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. I have prayed for you. Wouldn't that be good news to hear Jesus say, I have prayed for you? I've often thought about it the night when Peter made his big blunder and uh, slapped Jesus the hardest of anyone who had slapped him that night. What it must have meant to him when he was burying his face in the dirt on the side of Olivet, wishing that he could die. To remember the words of Jesus, the friendly words of Jesus, I have prayed for you. I have prayed for you. You think Jesus had prayed for you too? You can read about it, John 17. Jesus himself in Matthew the third chapter said that he was going to thoroughly purge his floor, borrowing again from the analogy of the harvest and the wheat. 
And in Ephesians 5.27, we're told that God's church is going to be glorious without spot or blemish when Jesus comes. Now, if the church is going to be without blemish when Jesus comes, then he's going to have to shake out the sinners in the lukewarm sometime before he comes. And if the church called Laodicea exists up until shortly before Jesus comes, there is an interesting, solemn, serious event that takes place from the end of Laodicea until the coming of Christ. It is called The Shaking, the title of this little chapter in early writings. Now I'm going to borrow from that a few excerpts or short paragraphs and invite you to study it further on your own during the week. It starts out with a group of people, group one, we'll call it group one, I saw some with strong faith and agonizing cries pleading with God. Notice these people have strong faith. Their countenances were pale and marked with deep anxiety. Now, wait a minute. You mean to tell me that people with strong faith can at the same time have deep anxiety? That's what it says. You know what that did for me when I read it? It gave me courage. Because I had thought that anxious thoughts and anxiety were incompatible with deep faith. And when I found myself anxious, I wondered if I really had genuine faith. Here it suggests that the two can go together and that the two will go together in the heart of God's people before he comes. In fact, I was reading the other day that those who are finally victorious are going to go through seasons of terrible perplexity in their Christian life. Strong faith but deep anxiety expressive of their internal struggle. You mean you can have an internal struggle and still have strong faith? Yes. Large drops of perspiration fell from their foreheads. Whatever else you see here, you'll have to admit that these people are desperately in in earnest. They're sincere about something. Now and then... Their faces would light up with the marks of God's approbation. When? All the time? When? Now and then. That gave me courage. I had the impression one time that if you're a genuine Christian, you're supposed to be living on cloud nine, peaches and cream all the time. No, now and then their faces light up. And again, the same solemn, earnest, anxious look settles upon them. Evil angels crowd around, pressing darkness upon them to shut out Jesus from their view. You see, the devil doesn't care how much we know or how good we are externally. He doesn't care how informed. He doesn't care how much we study the Bible. If he can keep Jesus from our view, he's happy. That's his one point. As the praying ones continued their earnest cries, at times a ray of light from Jesus came to them. When? At times. All the time? No, at times. To encourage their hearts and to light up their countenance. All right, that's group one. Now let's take a look at group two. And which group are you in? Some, I saw, did not participate in this work of pleading. They seemed indifferent 
and careless. The angels of God left these and went to the aid of the earnest praying ones. That means double angels around the earnest praying ones, doesn't it? I saw angels of God hasten to the assistance of all who were trying to help themselves. Oh, someone says, there it is. God helps those who help themselves. Poor Richard's almanac again. Please catch this phrase in its entirety. I saw angels of God hasten to the assistance of all who were trying to help themselves by calling upon God. That's the only help you can give yourself, calling on God. Do you know that? Away with this idea that we can help ourselves apart from God with the things that count. Oh, sure, some people can make a million, some people can become famous. But that's worthless in God's book as far as values eternally are concerned. We're talking about spiritual things here. There's only one way to help yourself. It's by calling upon God. And every time you come across a phrase that even suggests doing something for yourself, it has to include and focus on seeking God. The only way to grow is not by hanging on the clothesline post. It's by getting up to the table and eating And the one who tries to help himself grow is going to do it by eating. And those who want to help themselves stop growing are going to do it by not eating. That's post-Christmas. So the angels come to the assistance of all who are calling upon God with perseverance. But his angels left those who made no effort to help themselves, and I lost sight of them. I lost sight of them. What we're getting into here is the polarizing of the people who are called God's people, or shall we say the polarizing of people everywhere. Because this description is not confined to the church or the organization or denomination. It's talking about this world. May I propose to you that before Jesus comes, that large apparent middle class who have been trying to straddle the fence, the gray, go black or white, they go hot or cold. The larger group disappears and goes one way or the other, this is called the shaking. I asked the meaning of the shaking I had seen, and was shown that it would be caused by the straight testimony called forth by the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans. The what? I hope you got that when we shouted it out. Caused by what? The rebuke? The council. Now let's go back to what the council was. It's this council to the Laodiceans that caused people to get shaken up. The council was that we need faith and love, Christ's righteousness, and the Holy Spirit. If you're going to put those three in one package or one phrase, what would you have? What we need is the experience of righteousness through faith in Christ alone. Right? That's the counsel of the true witness to the latest scenes. Now let me ask you, why? Would anyone ever get shaken up with that that kind of emphasis? It seems like that's what the church has always been based on. Faith, love, Christ, Holy Spirit. But there's a large cross-section of Laodicea that gets shook, as we say, when this kind of emphasis comes out. 
Why? This straight testimony will have its effect upon the heart of the receiver, not just the externals, the heart, the springs of life, the motives. Some will not bear this straight testimony. They will rise up against it. And this is what will cause a shaking among God's people. Now, the only possible way that anyone could get unhappy and get shook at emphasis on Christ and his righteousness as our only hope of salvation would be the kind of person who has been leaning upon something else as his hope of salvation. Right? Why did the people in Jesus' day get shook? When he came along with the essence of his message, which was, according to the book Desire of Ages, self-surrender. Why did they get shaken up? Because they had been relying upon themselves and their behavior, their good deeds, their performance, their works, which is Laodicea's hallmark for their Christianity, for their salvation. They did not know God, and the proof was they did not recognize him when he came and walked among them. They finally crucified him, not because he was a bad man who had done something terrible, but because he was too good for them. And they saw in him a goodness that was a different quality than that which they had been depending upon. They saw goodness that went through and through instead of it being faked or instead of playing the role. They saw goodness on the outside that came from goodness on the inside. And somehow it galled them. It was like pulling the rug out from underneath them. Jesus, by his emphasis, toppled their sandcastles and their dreams and their security. He was a threat to their security. And Jesus has always been the great cleaver. Wherever the Apostle Paul went, remember, there was either a revival or a riot. People never stayed the same. And wherever Jesus is still exalted today, you cannot stay the same. You must go one way or the other. This causes a shaking among God's people. Isn't it interesting the way God still calls Laodicean churches his people? What love, what patience. Now, once in a while, we get into um, historical dialogue. Uh, There are uh, church historians of our own that have written of our history and have often debated whether a church has accepted the message of the counsel of the true witness And uh, most of the historians come up with a plus, pro, and a few come up with a minus. You can hear it debated often. All of the historians have to fade away into the wallpaper when they hear this next sentence, which is talking about the counsel of the true witness. I saw that the testimony of the true witness has not been half-heeded. The solemn testimony upon which the destiny of the church hangs has been lightly esteemed, if not entirely, disregarded. I'm going to paraphrase it now. The message and experience of righteousness by faith in Christ alone has not been half-heeded. This solemn truth upon which the destiny of the church hangs has been lightly esteemed, if not entirely disregarded. That's what it's saying. Go home and check it out. Now, some people, a typical Laodicean approach, have gotten the idea that the straight testimony of the true witness is what is known as the Spirit of Prophecy books, 
because we have titled them testimonies. It's like the Church of Christ saying that they're the Church of Christ because the name of their church is the Church of Christ. Well, you know, no church is of Christ just because it gives the name. It has to go deeper than that, doesn't it? What is the testimony of the true witness? Some have thought that it was the rebuke and reproof type of thing in what we call the testimonies, and that this is what causes the shaking. Well, there's no question that will cause a shaking. Any pastor knows that he could cause a shaking in his congregation most any time he wanted to. I know that I could shake up a congregation today by preaching a burning sermon on uh, meat-eating and uh, vegetarianism. We could really shake things up. According to uh, statistics, we could split the congregation right down the center, about 50-50. And then the preacher would be shaken out of the church the following week and be on his way out of town. <clears throat> there are those who have... Um, felt that great emphasis upon uh, reforming the church is what is involved in the shaking by dealing with certain standards and the uh, changes externally. I remember hearing about an effort in this direction, trying to bring on the great revival and reformation up in the Northwest one time. Everybody was supposed to quit eating meat. And the revival went pretty well until somebody found a salmon in the deep freeze of the local elder, and that was the end of that revival. And then, back east, someone told me about a movement that uh, was on to bring on the great revival and reformation in the latter rain by getting everyone to take off anything that glittered, like, uh, of course, rings and uh, pins and brooches and watch bands and even tie clasps. I remember first year in the ministry coming across a godly preacher. I had a lot of respect for him, and he felt that we should get rid of our tie clasps and our watch bands. He even had altar calls to that effect, and I took off my tie clasp and my watch band. And I got tired of my tie going in the soup. One day I saw some uh, bobby pins lying loose, and I picked one up and made a beautiful tie clasp. There were usually plenty of bobby pins around, and uh, even different colors. And uh, so I began wearing a bobby pin. One day someone saw my bobby pin. They looked at it and said, what's that anyway? They said, that's a bobby pin. I don't believe in wearing tie clasps. And I became proud of my bobby pin, you know. <laughs> and the last state of this man was worse than the first. And someday you wake up to the realization that God expects a little common sense. Now, I would not want to down standards in the church or vegetarianism. If you grew up in the kind of home I grew up in, you wouldn't know what to do with a piece of meat if it was handed to you. And I am for the conservative element. But what all we're trying to say here this morning is this, that the great revival and reformation does not start by externals. And that is not what this shaking is all about, and that's why there's some significance in noticing that the shaking is caused by the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans, which has to do with spiritual matters of the inward man. Is this clear at all? And the great shaking and the polarization and the great revival and reformation and the latter reign and the loud cry are preceded by great spiritual emphasis dealing with the hearts of men. Why do we feel that this is relevant to speak of today? Because 
I believe with all my heart that we are in the middle of it. Educators on our campuses today are noticing the polarization taking place. People are noticing it in churches. There are those in families who are noticing it within their family. People today are rapidly going one way or the other. It is one of the greatest signs of the nearness of Jesus coming. It makes the sun, moon, and stars look like antiques. It isn't so much what happens in the Middle East and the Far East and the Near East. It's what's happening in your heart and my heart right now, experientially and internally. It is a solemn, serious time in which to live. I believe on the evidence that this mighty shaking that has known some of its effects all through the years, but increases in intensity at the very end, is on. And I believe that if you look at your own heart under the magnifying glass of the Holy Spirit that brings I salve, that you know which direction you're going right now. Are you coming closer to God? Are you getting farther away? What is the direction of your life? Is Jesus the central focus? Look at his love in verse 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Part A, and there is part B. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Repent of what? Repent of our works that come externally instead of from within. Repent of what? Depending upon our quantity rather than our quality. Repent of what? Our living good moral lives apart from Jesus. Repent of what? Going along day after day without any personal, meaningful, devotional life. Without knowing what it means to take that thoughtful hour alone on our knees before God's Word. Repent of what? Taking Jesus for granted. Hardly ever mentioning His name while we talk about political and international events. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. That's Jesus speaking. And when Jesus knocks on the door, I don't want to be down in the basement. I want to answer his call, don't you? Shall we pray? Dear Father in heaven, forgive us for our blindness. Forgive us for our rags. Forgive us for our dimness of vision concerning the days in which we live. Please come near as we seek to wake up. Give us the Holy Spirit. And that I salve, we pray. Bring revival to our hearts, to this church, to thy people everywhere. And in this tremendous time, just before you return, help each one here to know which way they're going. And may it be closer and closer to Thee, we pray in Jesus' name.